This week on WealthTrack, a status report on bonds, the potential risks and rewards in corporates, treasuries, and munis with two highly rated fund managers. Next on Consuelo Mac WealthTrack. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairholm Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Just about everywhere you look, America is awash in debt. U.S. households recently set a new record of indebtedness, $12.7 trillion more than they owed at the height of the credit bubble in 2008. But context is everything. As recent Wealth Track guest, Cornerstone Macro's top ranked economist Nancy Lazar told us, Consumer debt is down significantly relative to disposable personal income at 88% of income versus 115% in 2008. And savings rates are up. Corporate debt is another story. It too has been growing significantly in recent years, but unlike more thrifty consumers, it is accelerating at a faster rate than revenues. Corporate debt is more than 90% of revenues. That is a record during an expansion. And despite historically low interest rates, corporate interest expense is barely off of its all-time high. What about government debt? In 2016, total U.S. national debt was estimated at $22.5 trillion. The federal government accounted for the lion's share, about $19.5 trillion, while states had a little over $1 trillion and local governments nearly $2 trillion. Again, context is everything. The last 10 years has seen federal debt skyrocket from about 60% of GDP in 2005 to over 100% of GDP, while state debt is held steady at 6% and local government indebtedness has increased to a little over 10%. There are always outliers, and one of the biggest is in the municipal bond market. The largest issuer of tax-free muni bonds by far is the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico with over $70 billion in bond obligations and $50 billion in unfunded pensions, Puerto Rico cannot meet its obligations and has gone to bankruptcy court, outcome to be determined. Well, what is the state of all of these bond markets and how best to invest in them? This week's guests each manage several top-rated mutual funds in different types of bonds, and they work together on the fixed income team at Thornburg Investment Management. Thornburg is a wealth track sponsor, but their collective performance speaks for itself. Jeff Klingelhofer is a portfolio manager on several Thornburg funds, including its five star rated limited term income fund, which uses a laddered strategy investing in bonds with staggered maturities so that a portion matures every year and is reinvested in a new issue. He also manages the four star rated strategic income fund, which has a flexible mandate to invest anywhere in the world and any kind of income producing security. Nicholas Venditti is portfolio manager for several municipal bond funds, including the five star Thornburg Limited Term Municipal Fund, again using a laddered portfolio, and the four star Thornburg Strategic Municipal Income Fund, which also has a broad, flexible approach. I began the interview by asking Klingelhofer for his assessment of the overall state of the bond market. How expensive is it? You know, I think for investors, honestly, if you were to paint the entire fixed income universe with a broad brush, it's pretty expensive, right? Investors just aren't being paid to take a lot of risk these days. So while securities are priced nearly to perfection, there's still a lot of risk out there in the world, right? We have a lot of geopolitical risk with whether it be China slowing down or North Korea issues. Um, we have questions over how the U.S. is actually performing at this point. We are printing kind of one and a half to two percent GDP growth, and that might be about the best that we can get in today's environment. So you know, one sector we have liked has been the U.S. consumer, but even within the U.S. consumer sector, right? credit card delinquencies are beginning to tick up, auto loan delinquencies are beginning to tick up. There is some signs of wage growth, but the U.S. consumer perhaps isn't 
quite as uh, on the ups, upturn as, as a lot of investors believe. So yields have come down, income has come down, and at the end of the day, the asymmetric return of fixed income really means that investors are having to take a lot of risk in search of that very marginal incremental piece of yield. And, and how does the municipal bond market fit into this, Nick? Is, is it kind of a, a universe unto itself with municipal issuers, or is, is it affected by the, the trends that Jeff is talking about? Well, to some extent, the municipal bond market holds kind of a, a special place in, in the investment universe. Right. But a lot of the trends that, that Jeff has mentioned are flowing over. Uh, valuations don't look very attractive. If you think about it kind of from a 35,000 foot level, we're, we're fixed income portfolio managers, right? Basically, we have two levers we can pull to try to juice returns. We can do credit. Hey, let's take a bunch of credit risk and try to get the yield of our portfolios up. The problem with that is that credit spreads in, in both our markets are basically as tight as they've ever been. So, and, and, and that means that the difference in yields between very high quality bonds and, and, and lower quality bonds is very narrow. So you're exactly. not getting a lot more to buy riskier bonds. You're not being paid. To exactly. So okay. again, if you, if you aren't being compensated for that right. risk, then probably you shouldn't be taking it. The other lever we have is, is obviously duration. We can buy longer bonds and try to get more income that way. Right. The problem we have with, with sort of that is that absolute yields, even after the run-up we, we saw after the Trump election, are still, relative to any recent long-dated history, really low. You knock inflation off of that, get real yields, and they're, they're even worse. And so investors really aren't being compensated to buy 10-year bonds as opposed to nine, or nine as opposed to eight. And again, why take that risk when you're not being adequately compensated for it? How big is the risk of a correction? You know, honestly, at this point in the cycle, I don't think that there's a huge risk that a correction is imminently, okay. uh, imminently coming. But the problem is, is if you ask investors that honest question at any point in the cycle, the answer is almost always no. Some of the feedback that I hear um, from people you know, that suggest people should be reaching for a yield right now is that unemployment rates are very low, 4.5-ish right. 4, 4 type percent. You know, the last time we were at that was in mid-2007. And so you can Before point, the financial crisis. Or exactly. Everything always feels great until it doesn't. Right. Municipal bond, correction. How concerned are you about a major correction in, in the municipal bond market? Somewhat. Uh, you, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> similar to Jeff, That's okay, I, I Nick. don't know Somewhat, that, yep. <laughs> that a major correction is imminent. But again, I think it depends on where you're invested and what you're invested in. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Yes. So tobacco bonds in, in the municipal space have gotten a lot of press over the last couple of years because they've performed very, very well. If you bought tobacco bonds, you deserve a cookie. The problem you have with tobacco bonds are that they are going to default. These are deeply, deeply non-investment grade issuers. They are drawing on their debt service reserve funds right now to make debt service payments and they are trading in this market above par. Tell me, what, what are tobacco bonds? So this is not Philip Morris bonds. This not is, Philip no. Morris bonds. So essentially what happened is, in 1998, the states got together, sued the tobacco companies, yes. said, hey, every, you're making everyone sick. Most of them are Medicaid payers. We're paying for it. You're killing us. You got to give us some money. They won that suit. What they won was the tobacco company said, we will send you money every year based on roughly how many cartons of cigarettes we ship to your area. Mm -hmm. The state said, that's fantastic. You know it's better than some money over time, a lot of money right now. So where did the bonds come in? Were there... So they securitized that revenue stream. Ah. So they got all the money up front and they passed the revenue stream through. What they didn't foresee is that smoking has actually declined and declined dramatically in so the United States. So therefore the revenues are much less than they much, anticipated. Much less. Right. So now you have investors who are holding these bonds that are secured by lower and lower revenue that gets lower every year as more and more people quit smoking. All right, so these bonds are gonna default. The revenue is going to run out and they're trading in the market above par. Wow. So look, in, in any market, throw out fixed income, real estate, equities, at any time when sort of the price of a security is as divorced from the fundamental mm -hmm. value mm -hmm. as we're seeing in some sectors in the municipal bond world, as Jeff is seeing in some sectors of the global fixed income world, right. there's a correction. Th those two things have to be reckoned. 
And generally, that's, that's a painful reckoning for investors. Now, the other big thing that's happening in the municipal bond market is Puerto Rico. And I remember talking to your colleague, Chris Ryan, a couple of years ago, and Thornburg has, did not own Puerto Rican bonds. Um, but it's the largest municipal bond issuer in the country. It's got serious problems. How has that you know, affected the market? And are there any opportunities in Puerto Rican bonds? Uh, so Puerto are Rico they, is, to put it bluntly, an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Those bonds are trading in the market right now, give or take 65, 68 cents on the dollar. Oh, so they're still that high, actually. They are still that high. I will tell you, in my mind, the ultimate recovery value on most Puerto Rico debt is going to be closer to 25 cents on the dollar. So again, there is still significant pain to be had for anyone who's playing in those securities. So what do we do as investors? And I know that, that each of you, you run several different types of portfolios. And, and one of them, which I guess is considered a kind of a core at Thornburg, is your limited term portfolios. So explain, Jeff, the limited term income portfolios that, that you run and how they work and why they're considered to be safer than some other types of portfolios. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're correct. Our, our limited term income fund is designed to be kind of a, an average bondholder's core bond portfolio. So one of the core competencies of, of our portfolios, I believe, is, is the ability to search deep and far for relative value, but only within the safer parts of fixed income. So it's 100% investment grade at time of purchase. It's US dollar only. These are the it's limited term funds. That's right? correct. These are okay. the limited term funds. But and they, they're also designed to have a pretty significant income stream, although in the relatively low income world today, still preserving a, 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 an income stream for our end clients. How do you invest the limited term? You use a, a laddering strategy. Absolutely. You know, the laddering strategy has been a core of our approach to fixed right. income vesting since the very beginnings of Thornburg. And what that allows us to do is to take away the need in order to, to, to look at the Federal Reserve and have a, a very distinct forecast of what they're going to do. At the end of the day, making a direct call on interest rates is very difficult, and the market prices that in relatively quickly. By having a bond laddered portfolio, what it allows us to do is always have a, 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 an exposure to the zero to 10 year part of the, the the curve. You start with a the very low maturity and then you, you move up and then, then as, just explain how it works. Yeah, so as having an exposure from zero to 10 years allows roughly on average, every single year about 10% of your portfolio is rolling off. And so as it, in the world we live today with the fear of rates beginning to rise, next year we have 10% of our portfolio that we can take from the very front end and, and reinvest into those higher rates. Right. And that really does help us to preserve and grow an income stream over time uh, and mute volatility kind of give the, the our average shareholder a better ride, a better experience, um, even in a relatively possible tumultuous time for fixed income. Mm -hmm. so, so think about that kind of just from a very basic standpoint. Right. Right? You have a portfolio that's roughly 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 percent of the assets in each rung of the ladder for the limited term muni for the limited term income. What happens is interest rates go up and bond prices go down, right? That's kind of the universal fixed income equation. There's very little any of us can do about that. So rates go up, you lose NAV on the fund. The principal decreases. But as Jeff said, you're getting this, this free flow of cash as these bonds mature. Right. We are de facto dollar cost averaging back into the market in now higher yielding bonds because we saw rates go down or go up. So now what you have is you have the dividend yield on those portfolios starting to tick up, which helps offset the decline in the NAV. Mm -hmm. And in my world, in the Muni world, the dividend yield is why we're all here, right? Mm -hmm. That's the part that's tax exempt. So we have always been big believers of the latter. We've run them at Thornburg for well over 30 years. Right. But I think we're even more of a believer in that structure today because of the uncertainty we're seeing, because of that, that rolling mechanism, which is very, very powerful. Look, our, our Thornburg Limited Term Muni Fund has never had a negative two-year rolling return. So the other strategy, one of the other strategies, is this, what you call strategic, which is, which is a, a lot more flexible. And, and a, again, you are a portfolio manager in the Strategic Income Fund. And Jeff, and so what you're doing, to explain what the, how that mandate works, and it, and it is taking on more risk for a higher return, right? Is that the, the deal there? That's correct. It absolutely yeah. is taking on more risk than our, 
our core limited term income fund. Right. And what that fund really is designed to do is allow us the most flexibility to find relative value wherever it may lie. You know, as Nick said earlier, when you're being paid attractively to take risk, we're happy to take it within the portfolios. Now, always within the context of what the portfolio is designed to do. And at the same time, when we're not being paid to take risk, we simply choose to take a lot less of it. And at one point, dividend paying stocks were a, definitely a part of your strategy. What role do stocks have now in the strategic income? Uh, in today's world, given the high level of potential volatility for fixed income, dividend paying stocks in our current bond portfolio are a very small portion of that portfolio. Simply because there's one absolute truth about stocks is they're more bo volatile than bonds broadly. And what about high yield bonds, which also have, have been terrific performers over the last several years, which I think uh, Larry Summers called uh, equity and drag. What, what's your view about the high yield space? Yeah, if I had to paint, again, any space of fixed income with a broad brush, unfortunately, high yield today is actually relatively low yield and very uh, expensively priced. Right. Um, you know, we, we are willing to, to roll up our sleeves and, and do a lot of deep dive uh, diligence and fundamental valuation. And there are some pockets that do look interesting to us, but broadly across the board, it, it's pretty expensive. And what are the pockets? So where are you investing given the very expensive and risky market? If I had to kind of classify what the Thornburg Strategic Income Fund looks like today, it would be defensive, focused on consumer, less cyclical spaces of the consumer space, mm -hmm. kind of defensive carry, defensive income. Um, we continue to hold a relatively high balance of cash to allow us to be opportunistic when and if the market does turn and reinvest that cash into a, a more attractive market in the future. And strategic uh, income in the municipal space, what, you know, I mean, you can't have the kind of flexibility that Jeff does. Right, right. I mean, you've got to be in municipals. So sure. So, so let me tell you about why I like Thornburg Strategic Muni Fund by telling you why I hate municipal high yield. I think that's the best way to sort of get All right. there. You're absolutely right. The municipal high yield market is nowhere near as diversified as the market that Jeff gets to play in every day. In fact, if you look at some of the major indexes sort of as a proxy for the high yield market, 80 Eight zero percent of the income in those indexes historically has come from two things, Puerto Rico okay. and tobacco. Wow. So just by virtue of that, you know there's no diversification. And right. both of those issuers, in my mind at least, are going to default. So they're beyond high yield and do something else. Throw that away. Let's say I'm a, a hypothetical high yield municipal bond manager who has managed to avoid Puerto Rico and tobacco entirely. I've bought single site hospitals, dirt deals in Florida, charter schools, whatever. I've had an unbelievable track record for the last couple of years. Here's my problem even knowing that. By prospectus, as this hypothetical high yield manager, I am forced to take at least 50 cents of every dollar that comes into my portfolio and invest it in low investment grade or non-investment grade credits. Mm. We talked about how credit spreads, the incremental yield I get from buying triple Bs as opposed to triple As, are as tight as they've ever been. Which means as this hypothetical high yield manager, I am forced to buy the worst stuff at the most expensive it's ever been. And that seems like a terrible, terrible investment strategy to me. Right, so where, where are you investing? So that Therefore. fund, again, it looks much, much lower on its risk spectrum. A fund that can go up to 50% below investment grade is running at about 2% below investment grade. Wow. If I'm not getting paid to take the risk, yes, you're not don't do take it. the risk. Right. I, I, think, I think the mistakes that people are likely to make in this market are stretching too far. Right. Are getting way, way, way outside of their risk bubble, searching for that extra five, that extra 10 basis points. Which has worked, actually, so far. It, it, it really it has. So has. it's really difficult if you are a responsible manager um, who doesn't want to lose principal to not go that route. It, it, right? it absolutely is. Look, yes. the, the key word is discipline. Mm -hmm. we, we believe that, again, that valuations are divorced from prices. Right. And you have to have the discipline to do the, the boring, the unsexy thing, because in the long run, we feel like that's going to be the right thing to do. Tough market, challenging market. All right, one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, given what, how you've just described, characterized the markets, what would it be, Jeff? What should we all own some of in a long-term diversified bond portfolio? You know, I, I'll give you a little bit of a nuanced answer. I honestly think it's 
it is a diversified portfolio where you believe the manager really is managing risks well. You know, one space in particular that we have found some value is, is still anything tied to the U.S. consumer. The U.S. consumer remains the bright spot of the global economy. So directly accessing the consumer balance sheet is, is one of the places we're finding value. Asset-backed securities in particular are, are a source of, of where we see relative value within our portfolios. They tend to be relatively short. Oftentimes they're floating, so they protect you from that gradual rise in interest rates. Um, most of them are still very, very liquid, um, and it's, it's a core portion of our portfolio today. Nick, in the municipal space. Sure. So I think you know anyone looking for municipal tax-exempt income, the right place to be is, is one in a laddered strategy. I think the laddered portfolios have proven themselves to outperform over a long period of time. And in a period like this where there's so much uncertainty, I really do believe the ladder is going to protect investors. In addition to that, I think being able to play in sort of the 1 to 20 year space, particularly that 12 to 15, kind of that elbow of the curve, over a long period has been the right place to be in, in municipal finance and in most fixed income investment. So that's where I would guide investors. So it, is, is there a role for passive in fixed income? The problem with passive is it generally forces an investor to take a very, very narrow view across a very short time frame. And one of the biggest benefits of hiring a manager who has a long history of managing risk and reward in various cycles is the ability to be diversified, right? When I look at the world of passive today, there's been significant flows into high yield passive, for instance, right? But generally, most of those passive high yield managers are forced to buy the very same security. So fundamentals and valuations get disconnected within that small space that they're playing versus an active manager has the ability to assess relative value by looking outside and beyond where the passive players are are looking to find that relative value, to find actual sources of, of, of better risk and return for their shareholders. Nick, does passive have any role in municipal bond investing? No, it, it absolutely doesn't for, for a couple of reasons. One, the municipal bond indexes aren't real. They're just an idea. So in, in the equity markets, an investor can invest in the S&P 500 or a value fund. They have those two decisions. An investor can't invest in the municipal bond index. They can invest in something that's trying to mimic the index, but not the index directly. So that's, that's a little tenuous right off the bat. You're saying they can't, they can't duplicate the issues that are in the index. It just is not possible in the municipal bond It's world. not possible. So think about it from, from this perspective. The S&P 500, there are 500 stocks. Right. There are almost 90,000 municipal issuers. There are over 1 million QCIPs. Every maturity gets its own fingerprint that's called a QCIP. There are just too many. The market is too broad to ever mimic any one strategy directly. So throw that aside. Even, even ignoring that, what you have is you have an index who is buying up or fake buying up things that are generally issuers that generally issue the most debt. Puerto so, Rico. Puerto Rico. So right. think about that as a, a fixed income investor. Throw Thornburg out, throw Jeff and I out. Do you always want to be investing in the thing with the most debt? Probably not. Probably not. And so again, the idea is, is that if you have someone sitting in a chair, like Jeff and I are, that's looking for relative value on a daily basis, on a long-term basis, we are much more capable of finding the right bond on the right day at the right price. All right, we're going to leave it there. Thank you both so much for joining us and discussing municipal bonds, Nick Venditti, and also the corporate space and the global space. Jeff Klingelhofer, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is seriously consider sticking with active management in your bond portfolio. This week's guests gave their reasons for doing so, but there is other evidence as well. According to a recent analysis by PIMCO, which we will have on our website, unlike stocks, the majority of actively managed bond mutual funds and ETFs have outperformed their passive peers after fees 
over the last one, three, five, seven, and 10 year periods. Over the last five years, for instance, 63% outperformed. The same cannot be said for stock funds where the majority of funds have underperformed their passive equivalents in recent years. PIMCO cites the unique structure of the bond market for giving the advantage to active managers. 47% of the $102 trillion global bond market is made up of non-economic investors like central banks and insurance companies who frequently have different objectives than beating the market. Bonds mature and the index is changed frequently. Active managers can anticipate these changes and act accordingly. As PIMCO's report concludes, bonds are different. To see this program again and other WealthTrack interviews on your own schedule, please go to our website, WealthTrack.com. Also, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining us on this Memorial Day weekend. And while you enjoy your Monday off, please take a moment to remember those who have lost their lives in military service to our country so we could celebrate a holiday in freedom and peace with our loved ones. Make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective. Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairholme Foundation.